Hi guys, in this lecture we are going to talk about the concept of solubility and precipitation reactions. All right, so precipitation reactions, simply put, are reactions where you have dissolved substances that come together, react to form some sort of solid, right? So you're gonna see a solid product. So a generic form for a precipitation reaction uh, that we're really gonna be seeing in this course it's going to be something where you've got two compounds, an AB, a CD compound, both aqueous, dissolved in solution. They're going to come together and form a solid product. And we call that solid product the precipitate. So a couple examples of precipitation reactions that are you know, quite interesting, I think, is uh, the coral reef formation and also kidney stone formation. So both of these are examples where you have aqueous solutions, you know, it could be seawater, and you have compounds falling out of that seawater, forming a solid and building up coral, or uh, building up kidney stones. In the case of, uh, you know, the kidney here, we have an aqueous solution. So for our purposes, what we're really going to be focusing in on in terms of precipitation reactions is a subclass of a broader class of reactions called double displacement reactions. Okay, so double displacement reactions are a, a general class of reactions that we're going to be talking about even you know, later on in the course as well. And they follow this general scheme where you basically exchange ions. So in the example, we've got an A, B, C, D. The A ends up pairing up with D and the B ends up pairing up with C to get these products ADCB. So basically an exchange process. Okay. So to look at a uh, chemical example, of the, some you know, uh, an actual chemical reaction equation, let's consider this reaction of an aqueous potassium iodide solution with an aqueous lead nitrate solution. And consider what happens when you mix these two aqueous solutions together. So remember, before you mix these two solutions together, the aqueous potassium iodide solution consists of dissolved potassium and iodide ions floating around. And the lead and nitrate are also floating around in this aqueous solution. Then once the solution of potassium iodide and lead nitrate are added together and these ions are exposed to one another, what ends up happening is the lead and iodine atoms end up coming together and forming this solid, right? A lead iodide solid. And then the potassium and nitrate ions just continue to float around in solution, uh, making a you know, aqueous potassium nitrate solution. So this is an example of both a double displacement reaction and a precipitation reaction, okay? Because we've swapped partners, right? The potassium and the nitrate, the iodine and the lead are now paired up, and you are forming a solid compound as a product. Okay, so we'll sum this up with the two bullet points then. Now remember, right, that this class of double displacement reactions is more general, okay? There, we're gonna be talking about different types of double displacement reactions as we move forward in the course, right? This specific example of a double displacement reaction is that of a precipitation reaction because we're getting that solid lead iodide. All right, now this fact that you know lead and iodide come together to form the solid compound, um, which basically means that the lead iodide is insoluble in water, leads us to our discussion of solubility. Okay, so simply put, you know, solubility provides a quantitative description for the extent to which a substance will dissolve in a given solvent. Typically, for our purposes, the solvent is water, but this is a more general concept. And <clears throat> substances with a relatively large solubility, we give them the label of being soluble. Substances with a relatively low solubility, we call those insoluble. Now, when a concentration of solute in some solution exceeds the quantified solubility, then you will get a precipitation no matter what. 
right? So in our example previously, the fact that this lead iodide compound comes together and forms a solid means that that lead iodide is in fact an insoluble compound, an insoluble ionic compound. So if we can come up with a set of rules for solubility, then we can actually predict whether or not a precipitation reaction is going to occur. So if you want to identify a precipitation reaction, you first need to construct that chemical reaction equation and then use a set of solubility rules, which will be given to you, to determine the physical state of each reactant and product. Okay? So here's our first little table of solubility rules to help illustrate what I mean by this. What we have in the first column here is a list of soluble ions. So the, the way you'd read this is you know nitrate, you know, chloride, sulfate, all these guys, they're soluble unless they are paired up with one of the exceptions listed in the second column. So for our first two entries, there are no exceptions. Right? So for example, if you see NO3 minus, then you then you will have a you know soluble compound for all of our purposes. Okay? Um, but go down to the final four here, there's a number of uh, exceptions listed. So for example, with chlorine, right? so the chloride ion will generally be soluble unless that chloride ion is paired up with either a silver, mercury, or lead ion. And the same thing actually happens for all three of the halogens listed here, right? So generally the halogens are going to be soluble unless they're paired up with silver, mercury, or lead. Sulfate similarly will be soluble as a tip general rule unless it's paired up in a compound with strontium, barium, mercury, or lead. So if we write out our chemical reaction equation from the previous example, potassium iodide and lead nitrate, right? We can construct step one here, construct that chemical reaction equation, and then come over to our table to identify what the physical state is of each one of these products, right? And so looking at the table, we're looking at iodine, and that iodide is paired up with lead, and therefore it will be a solid. It will be an insoluble compound. Potassium nitrate, we've got a nitrate ion, um, and that's going to give us an aqueous solution, which is what we saw in the previous example, and we're just using our tabulated values here to go ahead and verify that, okay? And so there's a, a little bit longer list of solubility rules that I want you guys to be familiar with. Um, the, the second set here, um, it, it, we're actually changing things up a little bit, right? So the, in this table, I'm now giving you a list of ions in the first column, and these ions are typically going to be insoluble, and they will only be soluble with the exceptions listed in the second column, all right? So typically, you're going to have an insoluble hydroxide, right, unless it's paired up with, you know, ammonium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, strontium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, etc. And so for the purposes of this class, you know, those two tables of solubilities, I want you guys to be very comfortable with working with those and, uh, you know, solving problems, predicting whether or not a precipitation reaction is going to occur. And we can see then in that final step, as, as we said previously, you know, if you construct that reaction equation, you use these tables, and you determine that a bunch of a cup, a pair of insoluble ionic compounds come together, and you get one or more. All you, but all you need is one insoluble product. Then bingo, you've got a precipitation reaction. So let's go ahead and look at uh, one more example here. Um, in this case, we're going to mix. Uh, potassium chloride with lead nitrate, right? So following the same sort of pr procedure, right? We can write out, uh, you know, you know the, the chemical reaction equation. We could follow the table and come up with the predicted products. And when we write out a chemical reaction equation in this way, by writing out the, you know, the, the form, the full molecular equation, and, you know, keeping those ionic compounds all built up in their neutral form, in the way that we've been doing uh, thus far in the course, what we're doing is writing out the so-called molecular equation. Okay? So we're basically providing the complete neutral formulas for each and every compound 
as they exist in their molecular form. Okay, so this has been the, the typical way that we've been writing uh, molecular equations. However, as we saw in the previous example, when we introduced this concept of solubility, when we are dealing with soluble ionic compounds, what actually happens in, when, you actually, when you put them into solution is they dissolve, they break apart, and they're actually present as ions floating around. And so for different applications, it's sometimes useful to have a symbolic representation of the reaction that actually breaks it apart and allows us to quickly see, quickly visualize what ions are actually present in that solution. Okay? So if we do that, if we take each and every one of those uh, reactants and products and say, okay, if it has an aqueous there, then I'm gonna break it apart into its respective ions. Once again, potassium chloride aqueous, we're gonna break it apart into its respective ions. Right? Similarly, potassium nitrate, break it apart into the respective ions. Of course, lead, uh, you know, the lead chloride here is insoluble, right? So it's gonna form a solid, so we don't break it apart, right? But all, we break apart all those aqueous solutions as they are present, right? Break apart all those ions as they are present in an aqueous solution, we come up with what is called the complete ionic equation, right? So basically the complete ionic equation lists all of the ions present as they are actually found. Now, if we look at this complete ionic equation more closely, um, you know, following our example, we have a couple ions, for example, the NO3 minus nitrate and potassium that show up on both the reactant and product side, which means they're not really doing anything. They're just sort of hanging out in solution, watching the actual chemistry occurring, and the actual chemistry involves our lead and chloride coming to together to form this solid product. So these ions that are just sitting around in solution, hanging out, watching, well, we call them spectator ions. They're spectating, right? Ions that appear unchanged on both sides of that chemical reaction equation are called spectator ions. And if we kick out those spectator ions, just cross them out because they're shown up on the reactant and product side, and you focus in on just the actual chemistry that's occurring, we end up with the so-called net ionic equation, right? So the net ionic equation only shows the species that are actually changing, actually undergoing chemistry during the course of the reaction. All right, so we can use these same principles that we just talked about along with this definition of complete and net ionic equations to come up with a method for writing a complete and net ionic equation. First step is to use those solubility rules that we saw in the previous slide to determine the physical state for each compound in the reaction. In other words, put on your labels, okay? Anytime you see a label that says AQ, all right, all aqueous ionic compounds, you split it apart into individual ions, right? And if you split it apart in that way into individual ions, you have formed the complete ionic equation. Then, as a final step, if you need that net ionic equation, you simply remove all of the spectator ions. Remove those spectator ions, just focus in on the compounds doing chemistry, and you have your complete ionic equation, right? So for example here, um, we, we can use our solubility rules um, to examine the reaction involving SRCl2 and lithium phosphate, okay? So the first thing we start off and we write our molecular equation, all right? So we've got our molecular equation here, and we use the solubility rules in the table to determine that both of our reactants are soluble, right? And the lithium chloride is soluble. However, SR3PO4-2 is actually an insoluble compound. And so what we have to do then to form the complete ionic equation is break apart all of those compounds that have uh, aqueous, right, associated with them. So we've got aqueous, strontium, chloride, aqueous, Lithium, also going to be aqueous, right? Phosphate, um, and, oops, sorry. And then we are going to form, at the end of the day, uh, this solid, right? Strontium phosphate solid, 
and lithium and chloride ions are still just going to be floating around. So leaving all of those ions floating around with their respective designations gives us the complete ionic equation. Then to form the net ionic equation, we cancel out those spectator ions and we focus in then on just those compounds undergoing uh, chemical change. Okay, so then we'll just do one final example so you guys have it for your lecture notes here. You know, uh, here's another example where we're basically using, uh, you know, a, another pair of aqueous, uh, you know, ionic compounds, mixing them together. And in this case, we're missing an acid, an acidic compound with a basic compound. And what we end up forming is the product of that neutralization process, water, right? So in this case, the acid we're dealing with here is acetic acid. And what we're going to do, is, remember the hallmark of an acid is a compound that ends up breaking up in solution and generating H plus ions, um, at least one definition of acids, you know, satisfy that criteria. And so basically we're going to break apart this acetic acid into an acetate ion and our proton, break apart that potassium and hydroxide, water, it's a liquid, doesn't break apart, right? We're gonna keep it intact for the complete ionic equation, but then we'll break apart our aqueous solution of potassium acetate. And so this is now our complete ionic equation. Once again, we go back through and identify that we have our acetate and potassium are just sitting around in solution, watching the show happen. They are our spectators. So if we cross them out, then we will end up with the net ionic equation and notice that for an acid-based neutralization process, the net ionic equation is in fact just the neutralization reaction forming water.